The first couple lessons in this series were dealing with anxiety and fear and uh, overcoming depression. And uh, now there's eight studies in the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's hard to grasp that. You know, it's easier to grasp that for people that don't live in a society where everything's handed to them. Uh, I spent some time with a missionary when I was a missionary. He's passed away now. Um, But he talked about how the American church was so much different than the church in India. He had started 527 churches at this time. It ended up being a lot more than that by the time he died. But uh, he said, "You can just you go into a village that's never um, had a Bible or anything. You go into a village with this message of hope, and there's going to be a church start." That's just how he said it. He said, all these places are just waiting for me to get in there. And this was in India. And uh, this was just in his part of the country where they spoke the language of Tamil. There was like 60 different languages in India, different dialects and stuff. And this was just in his part. And he said, you go there and, and when that message of hope comes to them, because they don't have anything over there. The way they'd start a church is they'd just cut down four trees and put up four posts and throw a tarp over it. And he said the tarp would have holes in it. But he said they'd just be tickled to death. And then from that moment on, they'd have services in that thing until stuff grew enough to where they could get a little bit nicer of a place. And... Uh, He said, you didn't see stuff like what they struggle with here in America, the depression and and, uh, things like that. He said, the joy of the Lord is everywhere in them little communities. And uh, ever since he said that, I've I've tried really hard to find that in the Scripture to where I can hold on to that. And uh, when things happen... In life, I have to remember that the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, what, what is there to glory about? You know, I don't sit there and think about the bad thing that happened. What is there to glory about? Um, Philippians chapter 4, I believe it is, says to uh, think on certain things. Think on whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are of good report. Whatsoever things are of uh, glory and virtue. You know, think on these things. Don't focus on the bad in the world. Because it will bring you down. That's why the whole world is down. And we got the social media before us all the time. We know every child that suffers across the sea. We know everybody (laughs) that's in pain somewhere. You know, it's too much info. And it's, it just brings us low. And without even knowing it, people that suffer with depression and anxiety, they don't even realize that's what's doing. I know some preachers that will get up and declare a social media fast in their church just to help them. You know, not everybody has to do it, but it's a pastor's job is is not to point out everybody's sin or the sin of the culture of the day. Uh, My job is to uh, um, help you to be Christ-like. If you don't want to be Christ-like, I can't help you. Nothing I can say would help you anyway. And I'm also to protect you from anything that would want to come in and unbalance that in your life. That's why I talked about the chosen, you know, that kind of thing. It's, a, it's not that I want to make anybody upset. I see, when I see something that could unbalance 
us and our Christ-likeness, then that's my job to talk about it. But the joy of the Lord, if we can get a grasp of the joy of the Lord, then when death comes or uh, finances are lost, you're still strong. Even though you seem weak because you don't have anything or you're, um, someone very close to you is gone now, there can still be a strength there. And that's the, uh, the necessity of these lessons, what they are put together for. And uh, even though depressions come and anxieties, we can be snapped out of it if, if we're really into the Word and it's, it's a part of our life. We can be snapped out of it, remembering uh, what we have in God. And so this is going to go through the Scripture and just show different people that rejoiced and were joyful in times of uh, when things didn't seem so joyful, but they joyed even for the slightest little uptick in a situation. Even though there were still a lot of people died, a lot of people were suffering, there was joy to be had in the Lord. And uh, in Exodus 18.9, it says, Who rejoiced in the Lord's deliverance of Israel? Jethro. And it's very fitting because Jethro's name has to do with that meaning. Um, it's like the excellence of Jehovah, I think, is how that put the excellence of Jehovah. I believe is what that means, which is um, many times we're, we're reading through the Psalms, that's something that David is pointing us to, to praise God for, for his excellence. He excels in everything that he does. And uh, number two says, Who rejoiced when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines? The women did. Remember this story when this one Saul really got mad because they're singing. Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands. That's when Saul sought to kill David from that point on. But the women rejoiced. Uh, the the idea here is to show how everyone has the ability, opportunities, and reasons to rejoice. Number three, who was anointed king causing the people to rejoice? Solomon. This was David's son, and they knew of the promise, the covenant that was given to David that his son would be on the throne and uh, they likened it to as long as his Solomon's or David's children are on the throne, the, the chance for the Messiah to come would be there. It was kind of a, a uh, they didn't have the whole story yet, but <clears throat> they were rejoicing in the fact that David's son was on the throne. And... Uh, who rejoiced concerning the wisdom of Solomon? Hiram. Hiram was, anybody know who Hiram was? He was the king of Tyre. It'd be like Lebanon today. He was the, uh, today that would be the imam of Iran, whatever they call him. This was Tyre, uh, This was Hiram, and at that time, Hiram and David were very good friends. That you don't see that today at all, do you? The 
the leader of Iran would never be the friend of the king of Israel. Or Lebanon, I mean. Um, the king of Lebanon would never be the uh, friend of Israel in any way. But see that David was different. The Bible talks about the tabernacle of David a lot and how God wants to rebuild that. And he's speaking about the church. A lot of people miss that. But the difference between David and the uh, Jewish authorities that took over later on when Christ came in this world and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and all that, David loved the Gentiles. I don't know, he had to go to war with those that, that caused problems and that um, to love his people, he had to conquer the wicked. But David went and made friends with Gentile kings. And he would tell them, you don't have to keep our law to know our God. Just know that our God reigns and give Him glory. And uh, that's how he made friends with, with other kings. Of course, it was after a time of war that he did that, but showed both sides of God, really. David never wanted to hurt people. And, and that's the way the church is supposed to be. Never desire to want to hurt anyone. David opened the doors to the Gentile nations. And so that's what he means by he wants to rebuild the tabernacle of David that has been torn down by the Jewish authorities and those that are in rule. They, they took away all that and they made it seem like God just loved the Jewish people and, and just hated everybody else. David knew different than that. That God's love for the Jewish people was to flood out into the other nations. And they messed all that up. And so the church comes in and we are essentially rebuilding the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David was movable. It moved around. It could go anywhere. And that's what the church is. See, we're not uh, confined to this building. When we leave this place, we are this, this temple wherever we go. And people see, either see God or they're pushed away from God by how we act. And so Hiram rejoiced to see David's son on the throne and the wisdom that God had given him. Number five, why did the people rejoice at Solomon's feast? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David and Israel. It's hard today just to get somebody to talk about God's goodness, let alone have a big feast declaring it. Number six, how is the heart of these rejoicing people described? Perfect. Their heart is perfect. And it's because they're full of this joy. See, there's... When you're full of this joy, nothing can come in and change anything. And it talks about the heart. It's meaning your countenance. You know, how you're feeling at the time. How you're, what you're putting off to other people. <clears throat> and the heart of these rejoicing people is described as perfect. It's strong. It's strengthened. It can't be brought down. And if the joy of the Lord leaves, so does the strength. Number seven, what did these rejoicing people prepare to build? A house for God. This was Solomon's uh, 
desire to build a house for God. Number eight, over whom did King Jehoshaphat and every man of Judah and Jerusalem rejoice? Their enemies. They rejoiced over their enemies. <clears throat> There's reason to rejoice at all times. In this life, our enemies don't always... Um, get taken down like we think they ought to. But if we believe the Bible, we know that they're going to. But in the meantime, our job is to bring those enemies over to this side. You know, they God never just went into a place and just destroyed it without trying to get them to come over to His side. And uh, that's what we're to do. <clears throat> just as... Solomon and the people that were rejoicing had this push, this unction, this desire to build the temple. So too will that do to us. This is our temple here, not the building, but the people that are in it. If we're full of this joy, we'll have this desire. And it won't just be a desire, but people will flock to it. If we can get it there. It usually, it's sad, but usually any church, any, even a good church, will have like 1% of it that actually is like that, that understands that stuff. It's shame. It's sad. And I, I don't know if it's the, the preacher's problems or, or uh, the world is just so strong or what. I don't know. But our, our job, our duty is to build God's house while rejoicing over our enemies. Our enemies today are what? Fear, anxiety, depression, addictions. We're not supposed to look at people as our enemies. That's why Jesus said, love your enemy. Who can love an enemy? You can't. So if you stop looking at them as an enemy, then you can you can love them. They're a they're a mission field. No matter how they treat you, they're a mission field. Number nine, who turned the heart of the king of Assyria, causing Israel to rejoice? The Lord did. He changed the heart of the king of Assyria in the things that, that he did. He showed that king that he was going to lose no matter what he did. That turned his heart. Number 10, how is the joy of the Lord described? It is our strength. And you don't have to listen to me tell you that. You don't have to listen to any other preacher try to tell you that. This The heading on this thing, you, you don't have to just believe that. It's spelled out there in Nehemiah chapter 8. They're trying to build their temple and there's so much opposition all around. And Nehemiah had to keep saying to them, had to keep sending prophets in there to tell them, you're getting down and you're going to get weak. The joy of the Lord is what's going to keep this building going up. And they'd actually stopped the building. They're, they finally let the oppression get to them and the building stopped for a long time. Till finally, somebody got an unction. The joy of the Lord sparked in them and they started something with a very small group of people, and they built the temple in like seven weeks. <laughs> Forty-nine days, they built the whole temple. See what the joy of the Lord can do? Number 11. 
who went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel, causing the Jews to rejoice. Mordecai. Adam, you just went and saw that, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah. See, Mordecai was facing certain death by Haman, which is a derivative of Hamas, really close to that word. And the whole, all the Jewish people, he wanted to slaughter all of them. And so to have it go from that to the, a Jew being in royal apparel was really something to rejoice about. Number 12, who maketh a glad father? A wise son. And just imagine how glad the heavenly father is when we seek after him, when we seek after wisdom. That's what I want, for him to be glad of me. Number 13, the... Hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. What can make a heart glad? A good word. And that's what the Bible talks about when it says the mouth can speak life or death. It's not what the word of faith believe. It's talking about, I can either lift your spirits, I can bring you up, or I can depress you. I can say things to you to bring you down, or I can say things to you to bring you up. Number 15. It is joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. Joy to the just. Number 16, name three reasons Isaiah trusted God. I know this is kind of a broad thing here. I'll just tell you what I got. It's kind of, I just put the three things I saw after that. Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Those three things. They really all mean the same thing. He is my everything. I seek after Him, and joy is the product, you see. Joy is the product. It may be a little rocky along the way, but there will come a time in your life that you're seeking will come to a place to where you have understanding. Even though you don't have comprehension, you'll have an understanding. You'll just know that... uh, God is in control of everything, and the worry will not be there like it once was, the anxiety. And if it ever does come, it's the memory, this word that we put in us will very quickly remind us that we have no need to be anxious. Nothing takes God by surprise. And if we're walking His steps, if, we, if our desire is to please Him, we can have complete confidence. Complete. Number 17. Therefore with shall ye draw out of the wells of salvation. Well, that really draws it in there, don't it? No pun intended. Talking about wells. <laughs> Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. What will the Lord swallow up in victory? Death. Death loses its sting when the joy of the Lord is a part of your life. Number 19. Who shall increase their joy in the Lord? 
the meek. Uh, you could also say the humble. Those that uh, they have their power under control. They're not exercising their physical strength over others. They're, they're slow to speak, slow to wrath. And uh, the meek, that was what Jesus was. He said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. The God of the universe was meek and lowly. So too should we be. Number 20. Will the Lord comfort Zion and all her waste places? Yes. That's a promise. That one day that will take place again. Number 21. Who shall return and come to Zion with singing, obtaining gladness and joy? The redeemed of the Lord. Are you the redeemed of the Lord? There's reason for gladness then, isn't there? Even now. There's reason for joy. And uh, really the only thing that God says is okay for you to get down about is the thought of someone else not having the redemption. He says, I, I relate to you in that. When you don't get down about not having the things that you want, God doesn't hear our prayers. When you get down and get sad about others not having salvation, that's when he says he'll answer those prayers right there. He'll fulfill that because that's... He said it in his word at the beginning. It's not that God doesn't want to give us everything that we want. He's just like we are as parents. Don't you wish we could give our kids everything that they want and it be good for them? It, it's horrible to be able to have to say no because you know later that's going to be good for them. Not getting everything they want. God's the same way, but He knows that will not help us. But when we come to a place to where we're all about somebody else getting the relationship that we have with God in His Word from the beginning, it said, this is when I can answer your prayers. This is when I can give you all your desires. I'll flood you with it. People think when they pray to God and it doesn't come, that God should be questioned why. But if we understand that He made these rules even for Himself, or else you can't have an operating kingdom of any kind if there's not something that even the king is subject to. God is subject to His own word. And so when he says, I'll bless you when this, then that's when it has to be, you see. That's when it has to take place, when you are loving other people. That's really how you build any society well. That's how America got started. You know, these little colonies, they, they operated like churches. And that's what blossoms. What tears down is when we get away from that. We lose all that. What shall all the ends of the earth see? The salvation of our God. And that's when this tabernacle of David will be rebuilt. When the church has gotten to all corners of the earth, the whole world will see the salvation of God. What will not return to God void but accomplish that which He pleases? His Word. If you speak His Word anywhere, anytime, it will accomplish what it meant to accomplish. A seed planted. What will the Lord create? New heavens and a new earth where we will dwell forever. That's reasons to rejoice. No more uh, cold, 
No more summertime heat. Be perfect conditions all the way around. That's a reason to rejoice. Will there be rejoicing in Jerusalem instead of the voice of weeping? Yes, there will. And uh, again, it says at the bottom, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I hope this has helped somebody. Eight lessons talking about the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this. Give us an unction. And help us to live by this and to always be seeking after the joy of the Lord. Show us how to do that in our walk with you. Bless everything today. Help us to rightly represent you. Any new people would be here today that we'd be a uh, very present help to them. Be Say kind words, things that lift spirits and just give them a good idea of what your character is like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.